We've heard some reasons to vote for this bill, but, uh, um, and there are reasons for every governmental decision, but hopefully some of you are wondering whether the bill before us is constitutional. The proponents will assure you that it is, citing a 100-year-old precedent that has to do with a city mandating a vaccine during a specific outbreak in that city. What they don't tell you is that that same case, although never explicitly struck down, has been soundly repudiated. First, that opinion was written before our courts recognize a concept of substantive due process, which means simply that certain civil rights are so fundamental that government action cannot substitute its perceived wisdom to take them away. But the main reason why that opinion has been repudiated is because of what it came to stand for. You see, when that opinion was perceived as good precedent, courts relied on it to justify myriad state invasions into human bodies, including things like forced sterilization, also in the name of medical or common good. In the name of common good and protecting others and stopping an outbreak, could the state metaphorically invade our bedrooms and mandate that everybody have protected sex so that an STD epidemic does not spread? I don't think so. We, the legislature, are tasked with drawing lines. And if anyone can tell me where the line of medical necessity reasonably ends to justify a law, then I will vote for this bill. But until then, it's a slippery slope and I must rise in opposition. Analyzing the bill's constitutionality does not end with the deficiencies in old precedent. The core question here is whether the state can tell parents what medicines to put in a child's body. The general guidance comes from Troxville versus Granville, a Supreme Court opinion from the year 2000. And there the court wrote that the liberty interest at issue of parents in the care, custody, and control of their children is perhaps the oldest of fundamental liberty rec interests recognized. They said it is cardinal that the custody, care, and nurture of the child reside in the parents, whose freedoms include obligations that the state can neither supply nor hinder. They wrote, it cannot be doubted that the due process clause of the 14th Amendment protects the fundamental right of parents to make decisions concerning the care, custody, and control of their children. Now, the proponents are correct when they state that other people's rights are also at stake. In California, all kids have a right to attend public school. And there are certainly kids who cannot be vaccinated because they have a serious illness or cancer. And they have a right to attend school with as much safety as the state can reasonably provide. The thought goes kids who are unvaccinated may spread disease, and that could affect safety at school. So there's a tension here, admittedly. But the overwhelming majority of kids are fully vaccinated. And so when it comes to weighing constitutional rights, a court would treat this as essentially a battle of constitutional rights between the small percentage of kids who cannot get vaccinated because they suffer from a grave condition versus the small percentage of kids who do not want to get vaccinated because it could cause a grave condition. So how would a court arbitrate these rights? It would inquire into the logic of the law. Does it accomplish its ends and is it narrowly tailored to do so without affecting too many people's rights? Here, it's hard to argue that this bill is narrowly tailored when it requires vaccinating five-year-olds for an STD, when it requires all kids to get a vaccination that was just 19% effective last year, and when bureaucrats can augment the list whenever they want. The broadness of this bill likely also dooms it from a constitutional standpoint. And think a little deeper and a little more critically for a moment. Here are those same unvaccinated kids who would be forced to homeschool. They're still free to play football with other kids, to, to mingle with them at church, at parks, to go to Disneyland. Adults are still free to go unvaccinated. So this is why some people, perhaps inarticulately to be sure, have expressed that unless there is some kind of law enforcement mechanism to check everyone's vaccination status and to isolate people, then the law is constitutionally unworkable. After all, those who are at risk of contracting disease can still be exposed by riding on an airplane or going to the doctor. Therefore, the state choosing to infringe on the right of st certain students to attend school simply does not make sense. Now, the constitutional infirmities are all you need to vote no, but let's transition to a question that I purposely cover second, and that is whether science today can be sure that science tomorrow will not wonder why it was so unenlightened. This concept dates back to the time of Galileo, and when dealing with something as precious as a fundamental right, it requires us to be mindful of the equally ancient concept of hubris. The United Kingdom had a swine flu outbreak in 2009, and they don't have a constitution like ours, so their solution was simple. Six million people were vaccinated in a program it was called unprecedented for its scale and speed. 30 seconds, Mr. Well, it Scott. turns out that for 1 in 50,000, that vaccine causes the immune system to attack entire clusters of neurons in your brain. For people genetically disposed, that vaccine actually triggers your own brain to give you a partial lobotomy. The best scientists in the UK studied this for six years, and just last Sunday, the British government officially acknowledged that it is true, and they expect to be paying hundreds of people, a million five each. That sum is not sufficient compensation for the teenage girl who falls asleep now 40 times a day, 
and is often awake. She's in a near cataplexic state. Taking an exam takes her five hours. She slurs her speech so much that the police stop her and think that she's drunk. It's she time, can, Mr. Gatto. Vaccines are safe for millions, but there are those among us who are genetically a little different, and they might be affected in profound ways. Some of us might disagree with those who make non-normative medical decisions. Some of us might disagree with the opposition's lobbying tactics. Some might call parents names. Some might even call them eccentric, but that does not change the constitutionality of this bill. In fact, in circumstances like this, when considering unpopular opinions, we are, we are on the hook for more vigilance. Thank you, Ms. Gatto. Ms. Kim, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 